Good morning, church. Please turn with me in your Bibles again to the Gospel of John. And today we're going to be looking at chapter 15, verse 18, all the way through to the end of chapter 16, as we continue in our study of this book. According to Open Doors 2022 World Watch List, persecution of Christians has reached the highest level since the list began nearly 30 years ago. In just the last year, there have been over 360 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. There were confirmed reports of 5,898 Christians killed for their faith, 5,110 church buildings and other Christian ministry buildings attacked, 6,175 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned and 3,829 Christians abducted. Additionally, the report revealed that one in seven Christians experience persecution worldwide, by and large in countries located in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. The top five countries on the list being Afghanistan, North Korea, Somalia, Libya, and Yemen. All countries that we would probably expect to be on this list, but maybe unexpected, is that three Latin American countries, Colombia, Cuba, and Mexico, were on the top 50 list of countries where Christians are most persecuted, experiencing hostility because of their identification with Christ. That's how Open Doors defines persecution, hostility because of their identification with Christ, which would mean that here in Canada, some level of persecution could become a more common reality in the near future, since we are already seeing increasing hostility towards biblical Christianity in our increasingly secular nation. So, for example, recent legislation could make expressing historic biblical sexual morality in the public sphere a criminal offense. We don't know that for certain, but once these new laws work their way through the courts, we will. And yet, this is really just one indication that our culture is now firmly secular, no longer rooted, generally speaking, in a a Judeo-Christian worldview as it once was, but rather rooted in more of a a postmodern, pluralistic, almost neo-pagan worldview that appears to have historic biblical Christianity in its crosshairs. You know, not that long ago, publicly identifying as a Christian in Canada carried with it certain benefits. It gave a person social capital in the neighborhood, in the workplace, in politics. But now, publicly identifying as a Christian is more of a social liability, more likely to get you excluded than included by your neighbors, fired than hired in the workplace, rejected than elected in politics. Whether we like it or not, this is the country we now live in, increasingly hostile to biblical Christianity. And so what are we to do about this? And more specifically, how can we be prepared for persecution that is likely to come. Well, in this morning's text, Jesus' final instructions to his disciples just before his death, we are given the answer to that critical question. What we find is this, that the best preparation for persecution is knowing what to expect. And as we'll now see, first of all, Christians can expect to be hated for Christ. As we've walked through the the Gospel of John these past months, we've seen over and over again how those who rejected Jesus' message of life and refused to believe he was the Son of God disdained him, opposed him, sought to harm him, and even now had planned to put him to death. It was a regular part of his earthly life and ministry. And so it really then should not come as a surprise that those who faithfully follow him are told we will experience the very same thing. And Jesus says in verse 18 of chapter 15, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Now the world, as Jesus uses the term here, is obviously not referring to the, the physical world or even humanity in general, but rather the world refers to the sinful spiritual system that is ordered by Satan and opposed to God and is manifested in godless social, cultural, political, and religious activity, whether the activity of individuals or institutions. 
And, and what drives this, as we read in 1 John 2, 16, is the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life. As the Apostle John says later in 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are from God and the world, this system, lies in the power of the evil one. And so it's this evil order empowered by the evil one that hates Christians and therefore persecutes Christians, as Jesus goes on to say in verse 20, and puts Christians out of their institutions and even will put Christians to death as misguided service to God, as Jesus will say later in 16 verse 2. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And so in other words, Christians, we can expect tribulation, as Christ himself sums up at the end of chapter 16, when he says, in this world, you will have tribulation, you will have trouble, you will have affliction for identifying with me. Notice he doesn't say you might, but you will have it, which certainly proved true later on for the 11 remaining disciples whom he was originally speaking to here. Starting in Acts 8, we read how there was a great persecution against the church. And then in chapter 12, we see the first apostle James uh, put to death. And then according to, to tradition, all the others were likewise martyred for their faith. And we know this to be true for Peter specifically because in, in uh, John 21, verse 18 to 19, Jesus tells Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he would, was to glorify God. Now, why was this persecution of Jesus' disciples then, and by clear implication, the continuing persecution of all of his disciples ever since, inevitable? I mean, isn't there a way that we could avoid being hated and opposed and mistreated by the world? I think Christians, especially in the Western world, like to think so. If we're just nice enough and friendly and extra careful about what we say and how we say it, and and if we just show enough care for others in this world, maybe this hatred and hostility can be avoided. But who is nicer and friendlier? Who is more careful and caring than Jesus? And yet the world hated him. And so the world will therefore hate those who follow him. In fact, the more Christ-like we become, the more discrimination will come against us. And the stronger our gospel Christian witness is, the stronger the world's resistance to us will be. And as Jesus goes on to reveal, there are two reasons for this reality. And the first is this, because our Christian witness does not conform to the world. So back again in chapter 15, verses 19 to 21, we read, If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. The world system operates on the basis of conformity. That's what Paul is getting at in Romans 12 too, when he says, do not be conformed to this world. Which means, so long as you identify with the world by following its trends and teaching and and making the right you know, public gestures, you'll fit in and get along fine. But if you instead identify with Christ by consistently following his teaching and publicly proclaiming his message of sin and salvation through faith in him alone, you will soon be out of favor with the world, bullied and blacklisted, even hated. This is why Jesus in his high priestly prayer in chapter 17, verse 14 says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Now, that's not to say that this will always be the case. 
No, some in the world will listen and believe the gospel we preach and receive eternal life. In other words, as Jesus said, they will keep our words just as some kept Jesus' word. But many, if not most, will reject our message and in in turn will, will reject the messenger, reject us on account of his name because we identify with him. They won't hate us because of something uh, intrinsic to us, right? It won't be because of our personality. It won't be because of our personal preferences, perceptions, or politics. That's not what Christian persecution is. They will hate us because we identify with Jesus Christ. It's like a guy wearing a Blue Bombers jersey to a Rough Riders game in Regina. He is guaranteed to experience some hatred and hostility. Not because of who he is, but because of who he is identified with. Winnipeg, the team Rough Rider Nation hates the most. Well, so Christians are guaranteed to experience some level of hate and hostility in this world because of whom we identify with, Jesus Christ, who the world hates most. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you, John says in 1 John 3, 13. Why? Because our Christian witness does not conform to the world. But secondly, we should expect this because our Christian witness condemns the world. So verses 22 to 25 in chapter 15, we read, If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. So since Jesus is one with God the Father, we saw that earlier in chapter 10, verse 30, the world's hatred of Jesus is ultimately hatred of God himself. Something that these unbelieving Jews at this time should have recognized because Jesus, you'll know by now, had performed so many miraculous works that no one else had ever done, which definitively proved his claim to be the Son of God. And so because of that, because of all that they had seen, all these signs, these miracles with a message, they had no excuse for their sin. They were guilty, clearly, of rejecting their Messiah. And Jesus condemned them for it, quoting Psalm 69, 4, they hated me without cause, which is now something that our reception of Messiah continues to condemn the world of, the world that has rejected him. Listen, our Christian faith and practice is a judgment on the world's unbelief. And so naturally then, the world will want to stay away from us and suppress our witness, just as they did with Jesus, as we saw in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verses 18 to 20, where we read this, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. Now, these are certainly some sobering truths. Nobody wants to be rejected and reviled. But to some degree or another, this is what we who identify with Christ are promised in this world. Therefore, Christ makes us aware so that we can be prepared. So that when hated for him, we will not be surprised and then stumble, but rather we will stand firm knowing this is the way. This is the the way it was for Christ, and therefore, this is the way it will be for us as Christians as well. We see this uh, in chapter 16, verses 1 to 4. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I've said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. A missionary with Africa Inland Mission was once giving his testimony many years ago after returning from some very dangerous service. He said that if someone had sent him on a journey and told him the road to take, warning him that at certain points he would come to a a dangerous crossing of the river and another point to a forest 
uh, infested with wild beasts, he would come to that dangerous river crossing and those other dangers with satisfaction that knowing he must be on the right road because this is what he was promised. Well, so he told them that Christ predicted Christians would face tribulation. And therefore, when tribulation came, he knew he was on the right road. And so can we know that when the world hates us for our identification with Christ, we're on the right road, we're on the right way. We are publicly living for Christ and living like Christ. Christians can expect to be hated for Christ. That's the first thing we need to know to be prepared for persecution. But secondly, we need to know that Christians can expect to be helped by Christ. If Jesus had ended with this sober warning of coming hatred and persecution, this would be a very discouraging and depressing text, but that's not where he ended. No, Jesus goes on to assure his disciples, past and present, of his abiding help, which he will give us through the helper, the advocate, the spirit of truth, who first of all bears witness to Christ with us. So back in chapter 15, verse 26 to 27, but when the helper comes, who I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, what an encouragement that must have been for Jesus' disciples who'd been with him from the beginning, the condition for true apostleship, as we see in Acts 1, 21 to 22. But also how encouraging this is for all Christians ever since. As we bear witness to Christ externally, the Holy Spirit bears witness to Christ internally in those who hear. Right? So so we, we preach the message of life to the world and then the Holy Spirit persuades the world of the truthfulness of this message. I like to think of it as fighting a war on two fronts. One fighting outside of enemy lines, you know, maybe with, with artillery, and the other fighting inside enemy lines through, through paratroopers and special ranger units. Well, so the battle for the souls of men happens on two fronts, by the church and the spirit, always working together from without and from within to fulfill the mission of Christ. And and this is an important corrective to those who sometimes maybe want to separate the work of the Holy Spirit from the work of individual Christians and the body of Christ in whom the Spirit dwells. Warren Wiersbe says this, I think think he's really on to something here. The Spirit comes to the church and not to the world. This means that he works in and through the church. The Holy Spirit does not minister in a vacuum. Just as the Son of God had to have a body to do his work on earth, so the Spirit of God needs a body to accomplish his ministries. And the body is the church. The Spirit does not float in some ghostly way up and down the rows of a church building seeking to win the lost. The Holy Spirit works through the people in whom he lives. And this is exactly what we see happened in the book of Acts when the early church began. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at the right hand as a leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Peter and the other apostles declared to the Jewish leaders in Acts 5, 20 to 22. And then they go on and say, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And so the first way that the Holy Spirit helps us in our Christian lives, and particularly in the face of persecution, is he bears witness to Christ with us so that our gospel proclamation is not in vain. But then secondly, the Holy Spirit also convicts the world through us. We see this in chapter 16, middle of verse 4. Jesus says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. In other words, uh, the hatred was aimed at Jesus specifically, but now that he's going away, it's going to start being aimed at them. So now he tells them these things. Verse 5, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So as the church communicates and the spirit convinces, the world is convicted, proven to be in the wrong, as the NIV says, wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment, the three basic issues that need to be corrected before conversion can occur. A person needs to be first convinced that he is a sinner who has not believed in Christ, Second, convinced that only Christ is the righteous son of God who can give his righteousness by his saving death, which of course was vindicated by his resurrection or as Jesus says, going to the father. And then finally, convinced that the listener will experience the same judgment Satan initially faced when Christ triumphed over him in the cross and will finally fully uh, experience at Christ's return. This is the conviction convicting work uh, of the Holy Spirit that now is accomplished as the church proclaims Christ to the world. And that's why Jesus said this is an advantage. We have this advantage that no longer is Christ walking beside them, but the Holy Spirit dwelling in them and empowering their gospel proclamation by convicting those who hear of sin and righteousness and judgment. This is exactly what happened in the city of Thessalonica, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 4 uh, to 9, where the gospel, he says, came not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, so that they turned from idols to serve the true and living God. And you think about his convicting work like this. It's, it's like a courtroom. We are the witnesses, and the Spirit is the prosecuting attorney, which actually the Greek word translated helper here, or sometimes advocate, uh, can mean. And as we work together, building this case for Christ, as well as a case against the unbeliever and their sin, uh, he or she is convicted, convicted of sin, convicted of righteousness, convicted of judgment, so that we hope and pray they then will helplessly come and cling to Jesus, the only Savior from their condemnation. And so that's the second way the Holy Spirit helps us. He convicts the world through us. And then thirdly and finally, he also guides us into the truth through his word, as we go on to read in 16, 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, we need to remember who Jesus was originally speaking to here, the apostles, those who had been with him from the beginning and were chosen to be his authoritative messengers, who had proclaimed the truth about him and what's to come in his coming absence. Well, the way they would accomplish this task was through the Holy Spirit, who would guide them into all truth. It's like an image of a, of a travel guide leading others in an unknown country. The Spirit would declare the information and implications specifically of Jesus' death and resurrection, as well as other church age truth. Something that the apostles could not bear just now um, because they couldn't fully understand the death and resurrection until it was over. But eventually they would. The Holy Spirit would declare it to them so that they would declare it to others. And that's what they did in their gospel ministry in the book of Acts. So we see in Acts 2, 40 to 42, right after the church begins and the Holy Spirit first comes upon them, we read, and with many other words, Peter bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. But even more significantly, the apostles declared all the truth about Jesus that the Holy Spirit would give them through the completed New Testament scriptures that were breathed out by God, as Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.16, 
as men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, 2 Peter 1, 21, which is such a great help to us. What would we do without the Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures that he gave us through the apostles? But it's also especially a great help when we are experiencing the hate and hostility of the world for our identification with Christ, because it delivers to us God's persevering promises when we need them most. When Richard Wurmbrandt, founder of Voice of the Martyrs, was first arrested by the Romanian communists because of his faith and and faithfulness to Christ. It was a promise from God's word that gave him peace to persevere. As he later recalled, I knew that I faced questioning, ill treatment, possibly years of imprisonment and death, and I wondered if my faith was strong enough. Ever wondered that before? He goes on, I remembered then that in the Bible it is written 366 times, once for every day of the year, don't be afraid. 366 times, not 365 to account for a leap year. And this, the day of my arrest, was February 29th. A coincidence which told me I need not fear. Psalm 1928 says, My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Well, Christ does that very thing through the Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit who bears witness to Christ with us, who convicts the world through us, and who guides us into the truth through his word. Which is a reminder again that Christians, we can expect help, this specific help, through Christ. But there's one more thing we can expect that helps us to prepare for persecution, and it's this. We can expect to be heartened in Christ. So with the promise of persecution for everyone who identifies with Christ, you might expect Christians to be a a sober, serious, even sad bunch of people, which sadly some are. But Christ expects us, no matter what we face, to rather be the hardiest of people, overflowing with joy, permeated with peace that he promised to us all. You remember earlier his promise in chapter 14, uh, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Or as likewise uh, promise in uh, chapter 15, verse 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Now, in wrapping up chapter 16, Jesus gives three reasons for such joy and peace, even in sorrowful situations, even in suffering. First, because he has risen from the dead. Verse 16. A little while and you will see me no longer. And again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. So the betrayal, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus were just a few hours away. We're going to get there in chapter 18 to 19. And so Jesus tells his disciples once more, he will be leaving them in a little while, and they will no longer see him. But then he says a little while later, they will see him again. And this was meant to give them hope, hope of his coming resurrection. But instead, it made them scratch their heads. They couldn't fathom Jesus dying and rising again. But after it all happened, they did understand, and it changed everything. It turned their sorrow to joy, as Jesus says. Which he then gives this wonderful image of of a woman giving birth. And a similar sorrow to joy she experiences, starting in verse 21. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also, 
you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take that joy from you. Well, the resurrection continues today to turn our gloom into gladness. Because among other things, it means that Jesus will also raise us up from the dead, just as he said, so that losing our lives will in the end mean gaining them. In chapter 12, 25, he he made this connection. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, that gives Christians a certain amount of moxie when we are facing persecution. It means that we can look at those who hate us in the face with love and without fear because the worst they can do to us is kill us and thereby send us straight to glory with the hope of one day being raised again. When the Emperor Valens threatened Christian Eusebius with confiscation of all of his goods, torture, banishment, even death, the courageous early Christian replied, He needs not fear confiscation who has nothing to lose, nor banishment to whom heaven is his country, nor torments when his body can be destroyed at one blow, nor death, which is the only way to set him free from sin and sorrow. Church, even if we face the worst, because of the world's hatred of Christ, whom we identify with. We can have joy, we can have peace, because Jesus is risen from the dead, and that means we're gonna rise with him one day. But then secondly, we can also have joy and peace because Jesus has promised us answered prayer in the midst of persecution. So verse 23, Jesus says, in that day you will ask nothing of me, Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So when Jesus returns to his Father, his disciples won't ask him for anything anymore, but rather ask the Father directly in his name, or as we've seen what that means, by his authority and as his representatives according to his will. And then the Father who who loves them and and loves us today will give all that we need to persevere in the midst of persecution and whatever else we face. Verse 25, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. That's referring back again to the the pregnancy image and earlier, the chapter 15, the the vine and the branches. The hour is coming when, when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. After his resurrection, when he explains everything. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say that you to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Well, as we see throughout the book of Acts again, that's exactly what happened. And it continues to happen in church history. It continues to happen today as the Father answers our prayers and to give us the help we need when we are hated for our faith. During the China, China excuse me, Boxer Rebellion of 1900, insurgents captured a mission station. They blocked all the gates but one, and in front of that gate laid a cross down on the ground. Then word was passed to those inside that whoever trampled on the cross underfoot would be permitted their freedom and life, but that any refusing would be shot. Well, terribly frightened, the first seven students trampled the cross under their feet, and they were allowed to go free. But the eighth student, a young girl, refused. And instead, she knelt down beside the cross, asking the Father to fill her with the strength she would need to persevere. She then stood up, walked around the cross, and went to the firing squad. Strengthened by her example and her prayer, the remaining students all followed to their death. So many other stories like that we could, I could share and we could, we could discuss, but you know what, at the, at the heart of all of them is the same thing. God giving his people what they need out of love to persevere 
in the face of persecution. Just like Jesus said earlier in chapter 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. But then finally, we can also have joy and peace no matter what persecution or whatever suffering we face because Jesus has overcome the world. Verse 28. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Now, this might be the most precise summary of Christ's ministry in the scriptures. He says, I came from the Father, a reference to his pre-existence as the Son of God. I have come into this world, a reference to the incarnation of the Son of God as he became fully God, fully man. And I'm now leaving the world, referencing his death and resurrection, and I'm going to the Father. Finally, a reference to the ascension of the Son of God. And we understand this, right? We understand exactly what he was talking about now that it's done. But the disciples still didn't quite get it, as we see in verse 29 to 32. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. So Jesus' disciples thought they understood now what was about to happen to him. But as Jesus points out, they still were ignorant. They still were in the dark. In fact, they were just hours away from deserting him when he needed them most. But even with this prediction, And his earlier promise of persecution before them, Jesus exhorted his disciples then and now to take heart, to be courageous, to persevere in peace and joy. Because whatever our failings, he was about to overcome the world, to win the definitive victory over Satan, sin, and godless society by his death. Wrapping up everything he said thus far in verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Bishop Cyprian of Carthage led the Christians of North Africa during a time of great persecution under the Roman Empire, and he himself died as a martyr in 258 AD. But a few years earlier, he had written to a friend these words, his friend Donatus. He said, It is a bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and good people who have learned the great secret of life. They have found a joy and wisdom which is a thousand times better than any of the pleasures of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are Christians, and I am one of them. For everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4. And so church, is, that is what we can expect as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Yes, hate and hostility, but also help and happiness. The joy and peace of knowing We have the supernatural support of the Spirit and the final victory in Jesus Christ. And what a difference that expectation makes as we prepare for persecution. So let me encourage you now in closing to prepare by taking time today to consider whether these expectations are your expectations. Do you expect to be unpopular and harassed because of your identification as a Christian? Or are you shocked when people dislike you and mistreat you for following him? And when you're treated badly, do you expect the Holy Spirit to nevertheless empower you to to keep boldly serving and sharing Christ with an unbelieving world, trusting that he can convict and he can convert even our greatest enemies? And do you expect the persevering joy and peace of Christ in the midst of it? Do you expect to never lose heart, no matter how great your struggle, no matter how great your suffering for Christ? 
This is what Christ has told us to expect. And so may we expect nothing more and nothing less as we persevere in faithfulness to Christ, knowing the cost, but nevertheless with his joy and peace in the one who's overcome the world. Lord Jesus, we need to be reminded of these things because in all ages, there is a hate and hostility for those who identify with Christ and who publicly proclaim the gospel of Christ. And we know that that is becoming more and more true all around the world, even in our own country. And so, Lord, may we be prepared. May we expect hate and hostility. Not always, but that inevitably that can come if we're being faithful to Christ. But may we also expect your help, help to persevere and help to see your word bear fruit. And also, Lord, may we be heartened. May we have the joy and peace of Christ in the midst of whatever comes, because we know you've overcome the world. Thank you for that. Prepare us, Lord, for what's to come. Help us to be faithful in Jesus' name. Amen.